Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very excited that all of you are here. This is such an important topic. And please feel free to, um, to connect in the chat and I'll see those and um, reply to them live. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me and um, just get ready to truly, truly think outside of the box when it comes to OER, Open Educational Resources. This session is titled Designing an Interactive OER Syllabus as an Equitable Practice. My name is Dr. Jennifer Edwards. I'm here in Texas at Tarleton State University. We're part of the Texas A&M University system. I am a professor of communication um, and I have been for the last 15 years at Tarleton State. Um, I am a local OER advocate for the last seven years and I truly believe that it has transformed our campus. I also serve as the executive director of the Rural Communication Institute at Tarleton State, as well as the Texas Social Media Research Institute. Um, within both of those institutes, it's very important to realize that um, in Texas, we have so many rural areas that to um, get an Amazon delivery of textbooks, it takes a while, um, especially right now with the supply chain issues and the mail issues. So it's important to make sure that our students are fully equipped for success at our institutions. So my OER story, um, prior to transitioning back to my faculty role, I served as the, the assistant vice president for student success and multicultural initiatives at Tarleton State. And one of our premier programs was actually the Mental Freedom Program. As you can see, MEN is in the Mental Freedom part, and it is, it is a program for men of color, especially at our rural institutions. One thing that the men truly appreciated, these are undergrad, mostly undergraduate men, they appreciated the textbook checkout because it was important for them to um, be fully equipped uh, without having to get a book loan for the supplies and the resources that they needed for class. And so um, that textbook checkout was a great program, but it was short lived because either A, the textbook author changed, uh, maybe modified one or two things in the textbook and the te textbook became irrelevant, or um, the, the faculty member chose another textbook altogether. So it's just very important. It, that was the turning point for me to say, I don't believe that this system is sustainable and we need to figure out another way to fully equip our students for success. Also, one thing I imagine that all of our campuses are dealing with from high school all the way to graduate school is that our students are graduating with older or antiquated knowledge and it's knowledge that is not as relevant. So I teach the social media course at the institution as well as some of the higher education courses. And it's important for me to fully equip our students for their job interviews or for their next steps within their um, career journey. Unfortunately, by the time textbooks are, are published and by the time textbooks reach the hands of our students, they're around three to four years old. So we are educating our students with old knowledge. And so it's important to make sure that we can do what we can as information scientists, as well as faculty members and staff to make sure our students are well equipped for the work world after they graduate from our institutions. Also, book waste and sustainability is very important as well. Um, if we have many versions of a textbook, uh, I love Goodwill. But one thing that you can truly see in each Goodwill store is the fact that um, there are so many old textbooks there. They still have very relevant information. However, those books are not being utilized and circulated around our institutions to contribute to our knowledge, our students' knowledge. And also last but not least, social media and relevancy. It's very important um, for faculty members as well as staff and the community to make sure that our students are reflective of the information learned at our institutions. And that basically means that they can establish themselves as um, basically as experts when it comes to, uh, to their subject matter. So say if it's public health or even social work or biology with um, the OER resources, they can tweet those out, they can communicate with the authors, they can really, really get ingrained with the material and make themselves more relevant and more marketable when it comes to their careers. So why do I use open educational resources? I've asked myself that many times because yes, it does take more work. It is not just a textbook with a, te with a test bank with all of the bells and whistles that people usually um, you know, appreciate from a, um, a plug and play textbook piece from a, um, from a book publisher. You have to work for it. However, it is well worth it. So I like open educational resources because it provides our students with day one access. That means I operate a no excuses environment. 
day one, let's go ahead. You have homework and you do not have to wait on Amazon to deliver your book. You don't have to walk all the way to the bookstore to get your book. It's an equitable practice. So no matter if you um, get financial aid or you do not um, obtain financial aid, it is something that each student can begin class day one with the materials that they need for success. Also is easier for the student. The students truly appreciate not having to buy a textbook, but also um, they can just get the access to the materials on their telephone super easily. Also with mobile, mobile access on their iPad or their mobile device is very, very accessible for the students. And also one thing I like, is that we were a former Blackboard campus and now we are a Canvas campus and it's they, the OER resources are easily integrated into our Canvas shell. So I'll show you what that looks like in just a few moments. And also it's easier for the professor every single day. <laughs> I'll walk across campus with my phone and say if a student realizes, oh my goodness, well, hey, Dr. Edwards' date, you know, can we update this because instead of a Thursday, um, is probably needs to be a Friday date. I'm like, okay, well, that makes sense. As I walk across campus, I can update that on my phone. The students get an automatic, automatic notification that something has been updated and it is like a well-oiled machine. Also, it simultaneously updates it on Canvas as well. So let me just let you know, after this session, you all will be able to, number one, identify how to integrate innovative elements on an OER textbook syllabus. Also know how to identify resources from the library database is one of my favorite places on campus to utilize an OER textbook syllabus. And then also last but not least, to know how to adopt and integrate the OER textbook syllabus in an online hybrid and face-to-face -face format for your courses. So how I use open educational resources. Um, I actually utilize um, Facebook groups as well as Facebook Live and a lot of Zoom lately during the pandemic to integrate these OER resources. Even in our face-to-face -face classes, I've taught um, classes from entry level uh, public speaking classes all the way to our graduate classes, but I integrate QR codes in almost everything that our department does to reach our students. And so um, that's very important for the students because they get access to that material from day one. But also I remember so many years I would stand by the copier for like days on end, copying um, six to seven pages per student. And if we multiply that times 125 students, that's a lot of trees. So I utilize QR codes for the syllabus. So I put the QR code on my uh, basically on the black, oh, not blackboard, but on the board. And the students scan it with their phone so that they can um, get access to that syllabus right then. And also I'll say, hey, click this for your um, assignment, for your reading assignment, and they can look at it exactly at that time. Also it's very interactive and I like that piece because again, it's a no excuses environment. I, yeah, I say no excuses, but we want to begin success on day one. Here's an example of my syllabus. Um, I will actually click that so you guys can see what it looks like. With every single semester, I actually design a new um, long a graphic so that the students will know that this is the course that they're currently enrolled in and they're currently completing the coursework for, but also the same graphic lives on my canvas as well. So everything is integrated. So anytime they see a telephone, then they know that this is the social media campaigns course. It has my contact information at the top. And also one thing that um, truly is um, that the students wanted was to know like we take we take all these social media courses but what makes this course different so I have um, it highlighted on every, every syllabus in turquoise what makes this class different and we talk about the importance of launching social media campaigns because they're being used for almost everything I have my office hours on there as well and also one thing I do not want to forget about is that we have a weekly journal club so so many things that we do live on the syllabus and never get revisited except if students just um, read the content, which they should. However, I wanted to know that the students were actually getting the content, were actually digesting the content. So that means that I um, created this semester a weekly journal club. It's a virtual weekly journal club for our students. I was very jealous. My husband um, attended Texas A&M, and so he was in the STEM fields. And basically, they uh, <laughs> had a weekly journal club. And I was super jealous about that because they had the, a chance to discuss articles and, and to truly dig into what the implications of the articles were. So I decided to adopt something just like that for our communication students. And um, I'll introduce you to our journal club. Also, um, we have a Twitter chat at every single um, 
Thursday at 8 p.m. And so basically um, with the Twitter chat, we answer questions about class, but we also talk about the articles, the OER resources that are being integrated in class as well. We have the course description, but also I have a big, <laughs> um, it's not an X, but like a, um, we're not doing this. And it's basically telling the students that this is an open educational resources course, and we will access the course materials from the university library databases. My thing is, they're already paying for it anyway. They might as well know how to use it and know how to use it effectively. So we are learning how to use the library databases, and also we're learning through the library databases as well. And because of that, I'm not requiring students to purchase any additional course materials whatsoever because it's already in your tuition and fees. These are the intended student outcomes for the course. We have our policies for the institution, just general best practices for my course. And then that leads to the modules on campus. And I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. And then we have our class schedule. So remember, I said day one, <laughs> no excuses, but um, these are the things that they will need to do every single week. So in purple, that is the weekly topic. And then in green and well, in yellow, we have our outcome for the course. And then in green, we have the article. So if they click that article, it's going to lead to that article on the web or the library databases. So this one is social networking sites. This is from um, a OER, a and <laughs> OER article. This one's from 2007, but it's a good foundational article for social networking sites. So they get to read that. And then also they have activities that they need to complete from, um, from Facebook, actually, because Facebook has, um, I like to call them OER resources as well, but they learn how to create Facebook ads. They learn how to choose a campaign objective and the Facebook ads manager experience. So not only do I use the library databases, but I also utilize the free course based resources from technologies that um, the students have access to anyway. And last but not least, uh, I'll just tell you these journal club articles have been interesting. The students really get into it. So we have a sign up sheet on on a Google spreadsheet. So basically I have this, like for example, using a media campaign to increase engagement with the mobile-based smoking cessation program. And basically we have that article and the students basically choose whether they want to cover the first half of the article or the second half of the article. And they read it, they digest it, and then they present it on Tuesdays. So if anyone's interested in coming to one of our journal clubs, please let me know and I will definitely send you an invitation because it's a great way for the students to digest their the content. The journal club um, is actually in, in groups of 15, 15, and 15. So 15 minutes is focused on, on digesting the article from presenter one and presenter two. Then the next 15 minutes is focused on, on the interpretation or basically discussions about the article. And then the last 15 minutes is focused on, okay, so what does that look like for society? What um, does it look like for implications? How can we use this in other pieces? So this was fo focused on smoking, but maybe something else is focused on um, uh, another part of, of health or, you know, like the flu vaccine or something of, of that nature. But it's all focused on the implications or the so what factor. Also, um, within every single week, we have the journal club and we have the activities. These activities are also integrated on campus and I'll show that to you next. But um, as you can see, we are hitting the ground running from week one. With that, um, this is our campus module. So that syllabus is also located here as well. And then also um, with our journal club, the students have to log their facilitation points and also their, particip their participation points for participating in the journal club. Um, each week has their assignments. And then also um, one thing I did this semester, um, because this one is an online course, I actually did um, a YouTube series about like any questions that they had about me or, you know, personal questions or professional questions or whatever. So I answered all of those questions in a three part YouTube series so they can get to know me a little bit better. And I divided that up over three weeks. So with that, we also had create a campaign. Um, students have to use the the articles that they read that week to create a campaign. So for example, this one is how to educate elderly individuals. <laughs> oh, oh, hey, Dr. Guy, how to um, educate elderly individuals in rural areas about community and state resources. So every single week they have to think outside of the box in order to, um, to create a campaign um, that's really, really not the norm for our college students. So with that, let's go back to, here we are to the presentation. 
I also adopted this for our intercultural communication class. And one thing that is so interesting, and I don't know why, but I put all of my lectures on YouTube. And because I do that, I end up getting a lot of comments from all across the world, which is great for our current students because they get to network with people who have different mindsets, but also different um, modes of, of uh, modes of how they live live or how they um, you know integrate what they're learning to their uh, their job or their future career and so the neat thing is um, i actually log all of my um, my tours of the syllabus so i do a tour of canvas so i show them my my canvas modules and then also i, I um, take them through the syllabus as well so that they can know exactly where things are located i do that every single semester for every single course so if students have any problems finding something they can always go back to that youtube video with that i record my lectures as well and i will tell you that this lecture is about four years old but it receives comments almost every single um, week from all across the country and so i utilize this because uh, number one i don't have to recreate something twice i don't mind doing it but i don't have to recreate something twice but also the students know that this is their go-to thing and one thing i did not integrate in this presentation that i think is super relevant is the fact that our students graduate they go on to get these amazing jobs and then sometimes it hits them like a ton of bricks like man i really wish i had that resource because my company is wanting me to do a presentation on intercultural communication no problem just go to my youtube channel and you can um, get access to that lecture again for free so that's another piece as well okay so with all of our edu open educational resources, it's very important that people not only know that they're there, but they're but how they can be utilized as well. Hi. So Hi, everyone. if you I'm are from, if you are an information scientist and you work in our library, um, you are superheroes on campus. You are seriously superheroes. And if I were to do any other profession, I would definitely be an information scientist because you guys are doing such amazing work to educate our faculty, staff, students, and the community about resources that they can utilize to make their lives better. So um, it's important to know as information scientists, what library resources are out there, but also how people can easily integrate that, those resources into their everyday lives. So with that, if you think about our library resources, podcast links are amazing. Um, to integrate that, especially for our students who commute, podcast links can be utilized on syllabus, on, on an interactive syllabus. They can click it, they can get access to it right there. Also guides from prior semesters. So one thing that I do is my students from like two semesters ago would create a guide. The next semester would use the guide, build upon that guide, and then they would integrate it in subsequent guides. So it's very important that your students know that they're contributing to the, the literature and to their body of work regarding um, the communication field or public health or, or counseling that they can build upon subsequent semesters. And also that's enabling you to work smarter and not harder because you're not creating things every single semester. So with that, also YouTube videos, I can't emphasize that enough. On the library databases, there are also videos that can be easily integrated and um, embedded on your um, Canvas shell or either on your Blackboard um, shell as well. Also database article links, that's something I use so often. Um, I use the permalink and I have a, a hack. It's basically a YouTube video focused on hacks that our students can use in order to use the library databases. So I talk about the um, citation guides. I talk about um, the permalink. I talk about how to save your search, um, even if your computer logs off and loses the battery, how to go back to your search, because I've been burned by that so many times. So I give them hacks that have taken me 12 or 15 years to, to truly get, but the students really appreciate that. So anything that can help make their lives easier that you can integrate in your OER course can truly, truly help transform learning at your institution. And also one thing that um, our new librarian has truly, truly um, exposed me to this semester have been lived guides. So utilizing the lip guides for your discipline is very important that our faculty, staff, and students know that lip guides can save your life. Um, some additional considerations that I want everyone to just keep in mind is to take an inventory of all library resources that could be utilized as OERs. 
uh, just because you know it's there doesn't mean everyone knows it's, knows that it, that those resources new resources are there but also to know that those library resources can be interpreted differently by different disciplines and you could have one resource that you think could be used one way but then after you introduce it to like six colleges they could have like 250 different interpretations of how that library resource could be utilized so let your library resources live to their their true potential also team teaching is a truly interesting concept so whether it's team teaching at your institution or maybe you're teaching the, um, communication and at a community college you're also teaching the same communication course then you can actually do team teaching have a a syllabus that you utilize an interactive syllabus that you utilize and then uh, you can actually team teach with that person who's either located across the county or across the state or even across the united states so it's a great way for students to network with one another but also it's a great way for you to integrate that teaching research and service to show that you are thinking outside of the box when it comes to oers and also connections with authors. One thing I'm waiting for um, something to happen is with our journal clubs, I'm putting all of those on YouTube. And because I'm putting all of those on YouTube, I am going to tag those authors of those articles to show them, hey, yeah, people are reading your stuff. But then also to know that they, how the, the information that they're putting out there that they're publishing is being interpreted by many different audiences, not just the pure academic faculty audience or pure academic faculty staff audience, but how they're being interpreted by students. So that could truly transform the way that people publish as well. Also, some additional considerations. I can't emphasize this enough. Check your links. And after you check your links at the beginning of semester, check it, check them every two weeks because those links, especially if they're located, if they're not a permalink to the library databases, those links can change and they change often. Permalinks are usually your friend, but when it's a link to an OER resource from another university or from or to a industry, like, like the Facebook um, educational pieces, check your links before you send them to students because it might link to something else. So just check your links. Also um, check for more relevant resources. That's super important as well because um, after you publish something, then on your syllabus, then um, you have it from semester to semester, which is great, but then you're stuck with something that says um, top ways that Facebook can be utilized in 2020. And then a student see that, they're like, okay, well, did your uh, professor not do their homework? But you need to check for more relevant resources because Facebook is adding so many features all of the time. Then also, um, just to make sure that you're working smarter, not harder, develop a pre and a post semester checklist. I don't care if you put it into your notes section on your phone or put it into a spreadsheet and you just check it off, but just make sure that you know, I need to check my links. I need to make sure that um, I update my dates on my syllabus. I need to make sure that um, this, this um, highlighting is still working. I need to make sure that the link is still working. So you need to develop a pre and a post semester checklist. And also I would keep a running list of things or suggestions that students um, contribute that they, they think would be helpful for subsequent semesters. I always ask, ask that at the, end of, at the end of a semester, what would be more helpful for the subsequent class? And so they always have things to say. I, I work with communication students. They, they love to talk and contribute suggestions. So I would definitely make sure that you have a running list that um, you don't have to think about whenever the fall semester rolls around again. And then also integrate your OER endeavors with your research, your teaching, and your service. So I talk about marrying as much as possible. When I say marrying, I'm not talking about romantic coupling. I'm talking about making sure that what you're doing is integrated with every single thing that your university values for um, promotion and tenure. So that basically means if you are, since you are teaching, make sure that your OERs are tied to your teaching. With your research, make sure that your research is also focused on some aspect of OERs as well, especially if you're spending that amount of time utilizing them. And then also with your service, if you are team teaching with someone from a community college, that's service. Um, if you are offering um, like basically professional development for people for even high school, um, high school teachers who are interested in OERs, that is also service as well. Integrate your teaching, research, and service with your OER endeavors. Um, but that's what we have um, today, and I am definitely open for questions. I, I know that this is a lot of information, but um, please let me know what questions you have because OERs, um, 
and I say OERs, open educational resources are absolutely fabulous and they can truly transform the way that we teach and transform the lives of students, not just for uh, this generation of students, but for generations to come. Um, it's truly, truly transformative. Okay, I'm looking at the comments. <laughs> okay, let's see. Kristen, I feel that this is such a great example of how OERs are removing are about removing barriers and such a great demonstration of the pragmatic aspects for students. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Yes, Kristen, just um, send a message to me. I'm actually going to put my email in the chat. And I'll invite you to our journal club. Let's see. Okay. Hey, Dr. Guy, I use structured reading groups with my first year students. What? And you've been teaching first year students for a long time. It's a great introduction to peer reviewed literature for them works online too. And Dr. Guy, just a charge, I'm just, I'm just saying, but um, consider publishing on that as well, because there's so many OER outlets and journals that, um, especially with structured reading groups, especially for first year students, that would be, that would greatly benefit from your suggestions. Oh, thank you, Dr. Guy. Let's see. This is very insightful and well organized. Thank you. Remember that in your evaluations. <laughs> uh, let's see. Kristen, such great advice. Awesome. Thank you. I would love to see a copy of your syllabus. It looks fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, if you can just send me an email, I will definitely send a link to you as well as to Jackie as well, as well as to Devlin. <laughs> Let's see, such great advice, thank you. Oh yes, there is a permalink hack for the library databases. Um, I have a YouTube video about permalink hacks, especially for our EBSCO databases. And then also for, um, if you, like I work with groups of students on undergraduate research, um, utilizing OER resources, but also um, if you search for something on, <laughs> on the library databases, and if you, like step away from your computer for too long, it will log you out of your search and then you will not ever ever be able to find that search again, in my opinion. So I would say that um, I'll send, send me an email and I'll or, or send me a direct message on Twitter and I'll send that permalink um, hack to everyone um, who, who sends that to me. Awesome, thank you, Dr. Guy. Let's see, as a librarian, I appreciate the insight into your workflow, oh my goodness, and how you integrate OERs into your work helps me to think about how to support faculty in doing that. Yes, oh my goodness, thank you for what you do because um, the librarians truly, truly help me um, every single day. And so I, I appreciate how librarians and information scientists think outside of the box and they've helped me think outside of the box as a faculty member, so awesome. And if you need any help or if you need um, you know, just a sounding board, uh, just let me know. Let's see, Kelly, thanks for the great presentation. <laughs> Is there one facet of the syllabus that the students find especially engaging or useful? You know what? They truly, for that class, they truly like the, the color coding um, to know what they're focused on that week. And also one thing I forgot to emphasize is the every single Monday, so today is Monday, I um, send a, an announcement to our group. And so basically um, to uh, my 25 graduate students um, in one class and 25 in the other, that I have what to focus on this week, it has a checklist and it has go to uh, read this article. So I put the, um, the links to the OER articles in the actual um, announcement. Then I put what you're supposed to focus on for the journal club, who are the journal club presenters, the link to get into the, into the journal club. And then also just in case they missed it because they are graduate students at the very bottom, I actually put what we focused on last week, just in case they need to catch up because unfortunately, you know, things are kind of interesting right now. So if they need to catch up, they need to catch up. Even though I said no excuses, sometimes I do appreciate excuses as well because life is life. Uh, let's see. And then also they, I put on that, um, on that, uh, <laughs> on the announcements, I actually put what we're focused on that week for the learning outcome is, 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 and then also what skills they will be able to focus on that week as well. Because when it gets to the end of the semester and they're doing evaluations, I don't want a shadow of a doubt to um, emerge to basically say, well, we didn't focus on that in class. Yes, we did. Here's the week. Here's what we did. So everything is very streamlined for them. So that's what I would put as um, things that students felt were especially engaging or useful. And then also the, the fact that they can just click it. They don't have to go to a page, you know, in a book to find um, the article to read that week. Oh, wow. Thanks for the nice presentation. I had a, a few questions. Okay. 
you mentioned you put your recorded lectures on your YouTube channel. How does the university or students feel about that? You know what? My recorded lectures actually record on Zoom or on QuickTime on my Mac. And so I upload those on my personal YouTube channel. And the students are not necessarily in those lectures, but um, they can comment um, below the video. And so they are able to interact with one another and also with people all across the country. So um, it's really neat for them to do that. And they really like it. They, they um, ask questions, they get ingrained in the content, they actually contribute more resources. So they truly, truly like that. And the university hasn't said one thing or the other, so <laughs> I'll let you guys know. Um, let's see, but good question. Let's see, uh, I'm interested in syllabus and in journal club. Yes, awesome. Please send um, an email to me. I, I hear some emails coming in too, that's awesome. Let's see, I mean that students pay tuition and fees to attend those courses, then, then you offer them for free online. Oh, I got this question from one of our faculty members, I'm a librarian. So basically, um, when we create open educational resources, I believe they're open educational resources. And so that means that they're there for, for public consumption. So they're so the students are getting, you know, they they do the assignments. Their assignments are not on the web, you know, on the, on the free web. Their assignments are on Canvas. Um, they are also um, exposed to open educational resources through the YouTube videos and through the open articles, but they're not getting everything, um, you know, in the open environment. The students still have to take their tests, the students still have to do their, their um, grad research, they still have to do their assignments. So they're still getting the, the bulk of the experience, but they're just sharing that experience with us others in an online context that is open for public consumption. And I also believe public consumption is very healthy when it comes to academia, because sometimes we can be very insular and we can think that we're the experts on this topic until we're, we're challenged or we are we encounter something new. So open educational resources keep, keeps faculty members very relevant and also keeps faculty members accountable for what we're teaching our students. So I mean, I'm all about accountability and I think faculty members should be um, as well. And so that's a great way for people to integrate what um, they're teaching in their class to um, to the world and we're contributing to the discipline as well let's see oh yay thank you for a great session very inspiring thank you let's see and also oh thank thank you for a truly practical session dr edwards i too am interested in seeing your syllabus hey please send me a reminder and an email and also carla yay well everyone thank you so much on um, this and you know, we have, if you think of anything else that I should have integrated, <laughs> I didn't, please let me know. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, my email address um, is jtedwards at tarleton.edu. And um, I'm, I'm always open for comments. So thank you so much. And also Amy, I think is going to close us out. <laughs> Well, everyone else have a good rest of your day and um, please do not forget your evaluations. And um, I look forward to getting, e getting an email from you. Oh, and Pua, I will definitely send an email to you.